About 10 months ago, I made the decision to stop making my videos on a free mobile phone editor and do this more professionally. I've always been humbled with how many people have loved the stories I've told, and it's been my dream to give these old tales the detail and attention they deserve. In my long absence, I thank you all for sticking with me, and hopefully you'll find my videos up to a much higher standard now. If you're new here, my passion is reviving the old folklore from the British countryside, saving these stories from being lost and encouraging people to engage with their ancient heritage. You won't find me trying to deconstruct these stories and belittle the people that believed in them. Instead, I want you to appreciate the mystery and magic that's fast vanishing from our world. For my first video, I read about a fascinating story in a book written in 1902 by a man named James William Fawcett. This book was called Tales of Derwentdale, and while I have an old copy of it, it's recently been reprinted by Land of Oak and Iron. He saved a great collection of traditional tales from the Durham Derwent Valley, and without him, I'd not be able to share this great story with you. He wrote about a manor house that was said to be the home of a family of giants. So I parked up at a place called Thornley Woodlands Cafe and took a nice walk through the forest to get to this mysterious location known as Hollandside Manor. There were some really nice carved sculptures along the route, and the grey sky and light rain meant that I had the place more or less to myself. Without further ado, I'm going to head up this hill and tell you about the giants of Hollandside. Welcome then to Hollandside Manor, or what's left of it anyway. We're actually really high up at the minute. We're 150 feet above the River Derwent, which is down below us on the other side of the manor. This is a really solid place to defend, but of course it has to be. Armies invading from Scotland, border reavers, moss troopers, all types of marauders, they're operating in this area. So like most manor houses in the far north of England, this place is designed to be a fortress. Let's go and have a look inside. There was likely about 10 rooms in this house, five upstairs and five downstairs. There were rooms on the ground floor too, storehouses for goods. Now when this place was built is unknown. It first appeared in records in 1317, when Thomas de Hollandside granted it to William de Boynaton of Newcastle. From them, it went to the Red Hoffs and then the Massams. It later passed to the Harding family until around 1732, when it became part of the Gibside estate. By the early 19th century, it was abandoned and fell into ruin. One family name I mentioned there was the Harding family. Remember this name because they're a big part of the story. Their crest was three greyhounds and this was carved on a stone panel, most likely above the door, but in the 19th century it was removed and lost. Now Fawcett tells us in his book that this place was built and inhabited by a family of giants and he says that people in this area always believed that to be the case. These giants were the Harding family that I mentioned earlier. Giants are fascinating creatures, huge and humanoid in appearance but very stupid and very clumsy, at least in the fairy tales we've heard. But with the exception of Jack and the Beanstalk, you've probably not heard of any stories of giants in British folklore. But in fact, there are quite a lot. In fact, in the Derwent Valley alone, there's about three other stories of giants. Now, Fawcett tells us about the stone used to make this manor house. He tells us it was sourced quite locally, about three quarters of a mile away from here, near Gibside Woods, from a quarry. The name of that quarry 
Wright's faucet was the giant's quarry. Perhaps just a coincidence though. Perhaps not. But Forster talks about meeting a local historian from the area, and the historian tells him about the things the Harding family, the giants, would be doing back in the day. He says you could often find them up on the roof of the manor house, looking out over the Derwent Valley. They'd look for sheep and cattle to steal. They'd bring them back here and store them on the ground floor, snacking on them when they got hungry. Essentially, doing the same kind of things you'd expect Border Reavers to be doing. This old historian that Fawcett meets, he really did believe that giants once lived here. And as far as I can gather, so too did other locals in these parts. But there's an extra bit of the story as well. And for Fawcett, this is just a bit too much to believe. So this local historian, he tells Fawcett that somewhere on the grounds of this manor house, the Harding family had a secret passageway, a tunnel leading underground down to the River Derwent below. And in that tunnel, the Harding family stored their treasure, their gold and jewels, that kind of thing. For Fawcett, this is a bit too much. He thinks it's silly. And he dismisses the old historian as a bit fickle and a bit superstitious. When you dismiss these kind of stories as superstitious nonsense, it leads to people not believing in them anymore. And when people don't believe in them anymore, it leads to them being forgotten. If there's one thing I want you to take away from this video, and indeed my channel overall, it's that folklore is rarely just made up. It rarely just comes from nothing. I could give you an example of another story not too far from here actually, of a castle with a hidden underground tunnel. And for generations, people believed the story of the underground tunnel was just nonsense. But then archeology span revealed that there actually was a tunnel there many, many centuries ago. So maybe people like that old fickle historian were actually onto something the whole time. What are your thoughts? Do you think that somewhere on the grounds of this manor house lies the secret entrance to the underground tunnel? Now, as much as I could really use all that treasure, sadly, I don't have my shovel with me, so I can't go digging up the countryside looking for secret passageways. That part of the story is gonna to have to remain a mystery for now. But what about the legend of the giants? Did giants actually live here? Were the Harding family a race of giants? There's only one place that could give us a clue as to whether there's any truth in that story. And it's a churchyard, not too far away from here. So that's where we're gonna to head to next. The churchyard I'm heading to is in the town of Wickham. Today Wickham's in the borough of Gateshead, but historically it was part of County Durham. And for future reference in videos, I'll always refer to places being in the historic counties. This is the Church of St. Mary the Virgin. Somewhere before making this video, I had not visited or even heard of. I love exploring old graveyards, and this one was very impressive. The graves were so old. This one caught my eye as Carr is an old family name of mine and it dated from 1697.
Now you might be wondering why I've brought you here, but this is where the Harding family were buried. The Hardings, as we've discussed, were said to be giants, and many people would respond to this by saying that this was perhaps just symbolic of how powerful they were, or that they might have been very physically tall, perhaps a big height of six foot, back in a period where people were far shorter than they are today. But in the middle of the 19th century, some repair work was being done to the Harding family vault. The workmen found a thigh bone that clearly belonged to a member of the Harding family. But the thigh bone belonged to someone of an extremely huge stature. It was determined that this thigh bone could not have belonged to anyone under the height of seven foot. Sadly though, I couldn't find a vault for the Harding family. So much of this graveyard is overgrown or damaged by the elements. If the family vault was beginning to crumble in the mid-1800s, then it's quite possible that it's since fallen into total ruin, or even just been removed. But what those workmen found was proof of what for so long had just been mere legend. And this is why I wanted it to be my first video, because these old tales are based in truth. So I hope you've enjoyed this first video in the new format of filming things on location. Please do let me know what you think. For my next video coming up, I'll be going to one of England's most haunted villages, where the spirits are still known to be very restless. I'd like to say a massive thank you to Albert Schofield, who composed the fantastic music in this video. He's made a unique soundtrack for my channel, and done a really great job. I'd also like to express my gratitude to my patrons who signed up to support me months before I started making content again. It's you people that made all this possible, and it's also the best way to help support my work. You can also help this channel grow by sharing it amongst your friends and on your social media platforms. Until next time, all the best.